Are we going to have a Hollywood Minute here, Seton? I, I got to get to Florio, but uh, you're teasing me here with Gwyneth Paltrow. Well, she made a pretty powerful admission uh, about mm. some of the sort of the lows that she hit during uh, quarantine. Oh, okay. Are you ready? No, no, no. No, it? I got to get to Florio. I mean, he's really busy. It's it's a stunning Unless Mike Florio wants to hear about Gwyneth Paltrow. Mike, I'm going to leave this up to you. We can talk football or we can work in Gwyneth Paltrow. Dan, I will not be able to function properly over the course of this interview if I don't know okay. what That's, happened. And I, when... and I believe you're being sincere, Mike. Uh, <laughs> yes, Seton. Well, this news broke, I, I think, maybe a day or two ago. Um, but it's uh, it's just taken me now to emotionally be prepared to to bring this to you guys. But apparently during quarantine, Gwyneth Paltrow broke down and ate bread. Oh, my God. Actual bread. Yeah. Carbs and all. Back to you. Did she announce this like a like a revelation? That's how low things got. She actually ate bread. With the crust and everything? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. My Gwyneth. She was really... Although when you said she ate bread, I thought you said she ate Brad. No. And I'm going, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, what? What? Uh, now let's bring in Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host. Uh, let me start with Tim Tebow. I'm I'm curious, you know, you had Chris Collinsworth podcast with Urban Meyer and Chris asked him and Urban basically saying, I haven't made a decision yet. When does he have to make a decision on Tim Tebow joining the 90-man roster? Let me just first say that during quarantine on a nightly basis, I took a large piece of bread, soaked it in <laughs> bourbon, lit it on fire, and swallowed it whole. Like so it. Like take that, Gwyneth. <laughs> um, when you look at the clip of what Urban Meyer said to Chris Collinsworth, I mean, at one point he says, hey, let's give it a shot. Well, but we haven't decided to do it yet. I, I, I don't... I don't, I don't get it, Dan. I don't know if this is a trial balloon, if they're, they're stung by what happened with the Iowa strength coach that they had on the payroll for like a day before Urban Meyer realized this isn't like college football where you just do whatever you want to do. This is a gimmick. This is a sideshow. Urban Meyer is trying to sell it as something other than that. It is an effort to sell jerseys. It's an effort to sell tickets. They can sign them whenever they want to sign them. And I think part of it is, frankly, they got to figure out what they're going to do with Gardner Minshew because he's wearing Tebow's number. And, and so that's a, that's a reason to wait because you want to sell the 15 jerseys right out of the gates. You don't want to have a back order of 15 jerseys and you don't want to have something awkward where he wears number 16, then number 15. But um, I, I, I feel like it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And I, I guess the one small sliver is the possibility that Urban Meyer gets enough pushback internally that he realizes this isn't college football. I'm not going to be able to make this fly in the locker room because there's going to be guys giving him the side eye in the locker room saying, are you serious? A guy who hasn't been in the NFL since 2012 in a regular season game, never played tight end. He had one snap at tight end. It did not go well. Yeah. And, and he's, he's going to get one of these jobs that there are hundreds of guys out there trying to get these jobs. Get out of here with that. I, I feel like he's going to have to deal with that internally. But it's the 90-man roster. That's, that's different for me. If, if it got down to the 53-man roster... Oh, then, it will. I, I think what will happen... You think if Dan, he gets on the 90-man roster, he's going to make the 53-man roster? Well, why is he on the 90-man roster? What's, what's the point of giving one of 90 roster spots in, in one of the most competitive sports in the world when there are guys every year coming out of the college level who are good enough to play at the NFL level and they're dying for a spot on the 90-man roster? You're taking that 90th spot and you're giving it to a guy who you should just hire to be an assistant coach. Make up a title for him. If you want him in the building, if you want to give your friend a job, do that. Don't give him one of the 90 spots where the guys are competing to be one of the 53. I think what's going to happen is he'll end up on the practice squad and they will elevate him on a regular basis to one of those two extra spots where you can take practice squad guys and make it a 55 man roster and potentially, potentially end up, uh, you know, dressing getting a gimmick play thrown his way, catching a touchdown pass. Fans are happy. Jerseys are sold. I, I, I just think that you're not doing this dance with Tim Tebow now unless you have plans for September. And I think Urban Meyer has plans for September or he wouldn't be wasting his time on it now. Why does Tim Tebow bring about anger? Well, I, 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 look, I, yesterday people immediately started to make the connection with Colin Kaepernick because Kaepernick's been out four years. And right now the strongest argument for not giving Kaepernick a chance is he hasn't played in four years. 
Well, here's a guy who hasn't played in eight years, and he's going to change to a position that he refused to play back when the quarterback thing started to, to fizzle out for him. But it occurred to me, this is very simple. No one was going to give her, uh, Tim Tebow a chance. Urban Meyer is the one coach who was going to sign Tim Tebow, just like Jim Harbaugh is the one coach who would sign Colin Kaepernick because he's been praising Kaepernick the last four years. If Harbaugh ended up being the coach in Jacksonville, maybe Kaepernick gets an opportunity. But Tebow gets an opportunity because it's the one coach who would give him one. And I just think it's this idea, Dan, that it started with the baseball thing for me. I had no problem with him playing in the NFL. He's a first-round draft pick. Josh McDaniels rolled the dice, and it kind of worked. You know, he got to the playoffs. I mean, horribly inaccurate, figured a way to win close games from time to time. Magical run in 2011. But, you know, it, there's a certain point where you just got to, you just got to, you got to move on. And, and if you don't move on, you're, 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 and, and I got no problem with it. I'm a capitalist. The Mets thing was about making money. Yeah. And I feel like this thing's about making money. So don't, don't tell me it's about football when it's about making money, because I think it's about Jacksonville, jerseys, tickets, excitement, and not about football. If I said Urban Meyer is either going to be really good or really bad, no middle ground, what would you take? Really bad, just because history tells us, other than Jimmy Johnson. You know, it seems like every few years, there's a college coach who comes to the NFL and he's going to revolutionize the game. And the media lines up to apply lips to his buttocks in the event that he is Jimmy Johnson. Right. Oh, 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 this is going to be great. Oh, Greg Shiano. Oh, he's going to be great. Chip Kelly. Oh, he's going to be great. He's going to revolutionize the game. Nope. Uh, who, who was the other Spurrier. one? Spurrier. Yeah, Spurrier. Saban. I mean, they're all one after another. Here's the guy. Oh, and I'll believe it when I see it. If, if you're going to be Jimmy Johnson, you got to prove to me you're Jimmy Johnson. And until then, there's only one Jimmy Johnson. That's how I look at it. And, and, and I feel like there's so many in our business that are falling all over themselves to assume that this is the next Vince Lombardi, I, I, it makes me inclined to go the other way too. And uh, we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's, it's a hell of a laboratory experiment. And from the Jaguars' perspective, every other thing they've tried for the past 20 years hasn't worked, so they may as well try this. He's Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host with Chris Sims. Um, I'm wondering if the commissioner can call the Packers before they, <laughs> be, before they do the, the schedule release. Like if you're running a league, you like you have the Packers opening weekend that 4:25 slot that that's Fox's big game, and the other game is Denver against the Giants, the team mentioned as the landing spot for Aaron Rodgers if he doesn't stay in Green Bay. Do you think the commissioner calls teams, not just the Packers, to inquire about certain things like a situation like that to help when they release the schedule? I, look, I, I don't know if the commissioner sits down with a notepad and a to-do list and I'm going to call Mark Murphy today and talk about Aaron Rodgers, but I suspect they have ways of getting information, okay. whether it's three levels down, but they, 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 they get the best information they can. What's going on here? What do you think is going to happen? They need that information. Packers Chiefs, biggest game of the year, potentially, other than Buccaneers Patriots. You got to put that game late enough in the season that it can be flexed out of 425 or flexed out of Sunday night football if that's where it would end up. I mean, you don't want it to be locked into Monday night football. You don't want it to be in a hard spot where you can't move it because you may or may not have Aaron Rodgers. So I think there are ways to protect yourself against it. But yeah, I, I, those, how do you not have those conversations when you have access to the individuals involved? And these are legitimate business considerations. Where are we going to put these marquee games? Let's take away the Buccaneers and the Cowboys. Give me the must-see matchup in week one. Wow. Uh, Steelers-Bills. I'm surprised that's a one o'clock game. I really am. A couple of playoff teams from last year with a lot of continuity. I mean, with the Saints-Packers, you know you're getting one new quarterback in New Orleans, whether it's Taysom Hill or Jameis Winston. It's not like Drew Brees is back. You got Ben Roethlisberger in what likely will be his final year going to Buffalo to take on Josh Allen. Uh, the Steelers going all in. The Bills trying to rectify how their season ended. I think that's the best game of week one. And you could argue it's even better than Cowboys Bucks. Yeah, but I think this might be because it's Buffalo and they're at one o'clock. That maybe Steelers, of course, are a national draw. I don't know if the Buffalo Bills are a national draw. If if this game was in Pittsburgh, then maybe it's a four twenty five game, but I don't know. It just feels like maybe Buffalo is still not graduated to that must see TV. What excites you more? Steelers, Bills, or Ravens, Raiders? Steelers and the Bills. Yeah, but now the Raiders, new stadium, 
I think there's a sensitivity to letting these stadiums oh, that sat absolutely. empty all year. Absolutely. This is the first time there's actually going to be human beings other than the players and the coaches and the officials in Allegiant Stadium. So it's got to have a prime spot. Kind of quiet on the uh, Deshaun Watson front here. Very quiet. What's that? What's that mean? It means that they're working on a settlement of the 22 cases. It's the only, it's the only reasonable conclusion at this point. And uh, look, it was nearly three weeks ago where the lawyers were in court accusing the other parties, each side of destroying evidence. And there, there were social media posts, Dan, and there were press conferences. And it was ugly and it was nasty. The plug doesn't mutually get pulled on those tactics in the court of public opinion unless there's something happening behind the scenes. And if they can get these cases settled to the satisfaction of everyone involved, I think Deshaun Watson gets traded. And I wrote last night that I think the two main destinations for him would be the Dolphins or the Eagles. And I think the Eagles are a team that should never be discounted in this uh, because they are desperate to get a franchise quarterback. And yes, they want to go all in with Jalen Hurts this year. But if Deshaun Watson, who's already proven himself, would fall into their laps, I think they would do it. I keep thinking the Washington football team. I think but, that's a but possibility. The, well, but the well. only problem is we know what's happened off the field with the Washington football team, with cheerleaders, with the owner. And I, I, I think that's a Molotov cocktail if you bring Deshaun Watson into a situation like that. Even if well, you make a great settled. point, Dan. Hey, and he's going to get suspended. Even if he gets all these cases resolved today, you can't not suspend him with 22 of these claims alleging sexual misconduct during massages when Ben Roethlisberger served four games in 2010 with two allegations of sexual misconduct. So you can't look the other way if you're the NFL. It's got to be a four or six game suspension. Some people I've talked to around the teams, not the league office, but the teams are thinking that's what it would be. I don't think there's going to be any hesitation to trade for him once these cases are resolved. Because if the cases aren't resolved, then what you're trading for is a guy who's going to be on the commissioner exempt list until the cases are resolved. Yeah. You know there's going to be a suspension. You assume there's going to be one. You trade for him, he serves a suspension, and then he comes back by Halloween and you've got him for the rest of this year, and more importantly, you got him for the rest of his career if you can keep him happy and, uh, and if you can work it out from a cap standpoint. Here we are in the middle of May. If you were betting on Aaron Rodgers where he'll be in September. I think he's going to find a way to come back and act like, well, what's everybody looking at? I mean, is there a booger I'm unaware of? Why is everyone staring at me? Why does everyone want to ask me all these questions? What's the big deal? I think he's going to do that, Dan. We've seen him do that before. You know, he'll he'll... Light the fuse, he'll run away, and after the explosion, he comes back and he chastises everyone for noticing the explosion. I think that's what he's going to do. And he's going to blame us, me, you, everyone who's made a big deal about it. We're just looking for clicks. We're looking for views. We're looking to make money off of his name when he knew damn well that he could have ended all of this with Tariko at the Kentucky Derby. Two days into it, he had a chance to go on camera and say, this is all overblown. This is all fake. This is nothing. I'll be there. I think he's going to find a way to come back because he's got no other options because I don't think the Packers at this point are going to trade him. But does he enjoy this? I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's Mike, a dynamic I think you I have see. to, though, Mike. I, I, the, the dynamic I see from players from time to time goes like this. Hey, everybody, look at me. What the hell are you looking at? <laughs> right? Well, he can always retire and do Jeopardy. Thirty million dollars to retire, Dan. No, oh, I know. Thirty I know. million. When, when, when people and the Packers say that, will seek all of it back. Yes, but I, when people say, "Oh, he'll retire and do Jeopardy," there's no given that he'll get to do Jeopardy, and, and they're not going to pay him thirty million dollars. Peter King made a great point a couple of weeks ago. On one hand, Aaron Rodgers has no hesitation at all to tell the world. I want to be the host of Jeopardy. No nuance, no ambiguity, no beautiful <laughs> mystery, nothing. I want this job. As it comes to his football career, he won't tell us a damn thing. He's speaking in riddles and enigmas and clues and whispers and tell, just tell us what you want, Aaron. What's so hard about telling people what you want when you've already proven that you have the capacity? to? Well, do it? I said that to Shefty, like, come on, like Aaron owes it to people. And then Shefty's like, no, he doesn't. I go, yes, uh, he does. Shefty's getting himself in line for the scoop of what happens next with Aaron. Dan, come on. Come on, Dan. Shef Shefty's taken every bullet he can for Aaron. That whole thing about that he's the one who ch bull crap. Rogers wanted that out there. Shefty took the bullet so that when the next move comes, Shefty's the one who gets it.
Rodgers wanted that out there the day that it hit. Not that wasn't Shefty sitting back working a chessboard. That was Rodgers working the chessboard that may have included Shefty as one of the pawns. You should have Shefty on your show. Oh, man, he's welcome anytime. I, we tell it like it is, baby. I'm too old to give a crap anymore, Dan. <laughs> Life's too short to tiptoe and kiss ass and pretend to play the game. Do you right? think you could take Adam Schefter? Oh, I could take him. Oh, I could take him. It's in pretty good shape. I, I will only pick a fight with people that I know that I could beat up. Really? So, so you, that, Which is why I'd never pick a fight with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, Paul. It's Dan a after, height thing. It's height and reach. <laughs> yes. yes Dan, Paul. that's already breaking this one down. Now, Florio's in good shape. He's got good size arms. They're sneaky. Covers them up a lot. Schefter's a thick guy. I don't know how athletic he is or if he could fight, but he's, he was a Northwestern guy, not the toughest school. We'll just do the tail of the tape. I'll show up anytime, any place for the measurements for the tail <laughs> of the tape. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Thank you, bud. Thank you, man. That's Mike Florio, Thank Pro Football Talk Live co-host.